Pharos, Noveria is a cool, rocky world with most of its hydrosphere locked up in massive glaciers. A privately chartered colony world, the planet is owned by the Noveria Development Corporation Holding Company. The NDC is funded by investment capital from two dozen high technology development firms and administrated by an executive board representing their interests. The investors built remote hot labs in isolated locations across Noveria's surface. These facilities are used for research too dangerous or controversial to be performed elsewhere, as Noveria is technically not part of Citadel space and therefore exempt from council law. By special arrangement, Citadel special tactics and reconnaissance agents have been granted extraterritorial privileges, but it remains to be seen how committed the executive board is to that principle. Given its unique situation, it is understandable that Noveria is often implicated in all manner of wild conspiracy theories. Pharos is a habitable world in the Attican Beta Cluster. Two-thirds of the habitable surface is covered with the ruins of a crumbling Prothean megatropolis. In the millennia since the Prothean extinction, the ruins have been repeatedly picked over by looters many times. Pharos was considered a poor prospect for colonization, as little open ground remains for agriculture. The only sizable freshwater sources are the poles, which are tapped by the decaying Prothean aqueduct systems. The dead cities, while in good condition considering their antiquity, are of uncertain stability. Ground level is congested by a dozen meters of fallen debris, and the air is fouled by dust. In 2178, the Human Exogeny Corporation announced its intention to place a permanent colony on Pharos to thoroughly explore the ruins. The pioneer settlement was placed on the upper levels of several intact skyscrapers, using the surviving Prothean aqueducts and rooftop hydroponic gardens to support the population. No, there are between two and four hundred billion stars in the galaxy, and less than one percent of them have ever been visited or had their systems properly surveyed. Humanity's early expansion into the Attican Traverse was haphazard, a desperate race to claim habitable planets where populations can be economically settled. Ignored in the wake of this land grab were thousands of less hospitable worlds, each potentially rich with industrial resources. The wealth of entire solar systems lies untapped, waiting for corporate survey teams or independent pioneers to discover and exploit them. However, this is not an easy task. In addition to the environmental hazards, the fact that uncharted worlds are largely ignored makes them popular bases for criminals, revolutionaries, cults, and others who wish to remain unnoticed by galactic society. Stand by, shore party. Decontamination in progress. I heard what happened to Captain Anderson. He survives a hundred battles and then gets taken down by backroom politics. Just watch your back, Commander. If things go bad on this mission, you're next on their chopping block. Saren's out there somewhere, and we're gonna find him. Everyone on this ship's behind you, Commander. 100%. Intercom's open. If you got anything you want to say to the crew, now's the time. This is Commander Shepard speaking. We have our orders. Find Saren before he finds the conduit. I won't lie to you, crew. This mission isn't going to be easy. For too long, our species has stood apart from the others. Now it's time for us to step up and do our part for the rest of the galaxy. Time to show them what humans are made of. Our enemy knows we're coming. When we go into the Traverse, Saren's followers will be waiting for us. But we'll be ready for them, too. Humanity needs to do this. Not just for our own sake, but for the sake of every other species in Citadel space. Saren must be stopped, and I promise you all, we will stop him. Well said, Commander. Captain will be proud. The Captain gave up everything so I could have this chance. We can't fail. Yes, ma'am.
If anyone has to take over for Captain Anderson, I'm glad it's you. I'm not sure about having non-humans on our ship, though. We're all on the same team here, Presley. With all due respect, ma'am, that's what they said about Nihilus. Look how that turned out. Speak freely, Presley. I want to know if you have a problem with non-humans. It's not that, Commander. Humanity has always handled its own problems. Saren attacked one of our colonies. We should be the ones to stop him. We don't need their help. Some people think asking for help is a sign of weakness. That's just being stupid and stubborn. No matter how strong you are, allies can make you stronger. I guess so. Maybe I'm just stuck in the old ways of thinking. But don't worry, Commander. This won't be a problem. Carry on, Presley. Yes, ma'am. Commander, something you need? How's the Normandy performing? Is she everything they said she'd be? She's the best ship in the fleet. If you've got a pilot who knows how to handle her. Balance isn't what you'd expect. Takes a while to get used to that oversized drive core we got stuffed in the back, and her power can sneak up on you if you're not careful. The Normandy's probably too much ship for your average Alliance pilot, Commander. Lucky for you, I'm anything but average. I like to know my crew. Mind if I ask you a few questions? I can see where this is going. You did a background check on me, didn't you? Well, I'll tell you the same thing I told the captain. You want me as your pilot. I'm not good. I'm not even great. I am the best damn helmsman in the Alliance fleet. Top of my class in flight school, I earned that. All those commendations in my file, I earned every single one. Those weren't given to me as charity for my disease. I'm sorry, Joker. I didn't even know you were sick. You mean... You mean you didn't know? Oh, crap. Okay, I've got Vrolic Syndrome, brittle bone disease. The bones in my legs never develop properly. They're basically hollow, too much force, and they'll shatter. Even with crutches and my leg braces, it's hard to get around. One wrong step and crack! It's very dramatic. But I've learned to manage my condition, Commander. Put the Normandy in my hands and I'll make her dance for you. Just don't ask me to get up and dance unless, you know, you like the sound of snapping shin bones. Why does everyone call you Joker? It's a lot shorter than saying Alliance Flight Lieutenant Jeff Moreau. Plus, I love to make little children laugh. I was just thinking how much you remind me of Santa Claus. Look, I didn't pick the name. One of the instructors in flight school used to bug me about never smiling. She started calling me Joker, mm -hmm, and it stuck. Why didn't you ever smile? Hey, I worked my ass off in flight school, Commander. The world's not gonna hand you anything if you go around grinning like an idiot. By the end of the year, I was the best pilot in the academy. Even better than the instructors, and everybody knew it. They'd all got their asses kicked by the sickly kid with the creaky little legs. One guess who was smiling at graduation. I have to go. All right, see ya. The Normandy is a prototype starship developed by the Human Systems Alliance with the assistance of the Citadel Council. It is optimized for scouting and reconnaissance missions in unstable regions using state-of-the-art stealth technology. For most ships, the heat generated through standard operations is easily detectable against the absolute zero background of space. The Normandy, however, is able to temporarily sink this heat within the hull. Combined with refrigeration of the exterior hull, the ship can travel undetected for hours or drift passively for days of covert observation. This is not without risk. The stored heat must eventually be radiated, or it will build to levels capable of cooking the crew alive. Another component of the stealth system is the Normandy's revolutionary Tantalus Drive, a mass effect core twice the standard size. The Tantalus Drive generates mass concentrations that the Normandy falls into, allowing it to move without the use of heat-emitting thrusters.
Yes, Commander? Is there something you need? I should go. Goodbye, Commander. Anything you need, Commander? Just trying to get a sense of where the crew's at. Thoughts? I've wasted enough of your time for now, Commander. We'll have time for personal debriefings later. We'll talk another time, Lieutenant. Commander? ship you got, Shepard. What can I do for you? What's your story, Rex? There's no story. Go ask the Quarian if you want stories. You Krogans live for centuries. Don't tell me you haven't had a few interesting adventures. Well, there was this one time the Turians almost wiped out our entire race. That was fun. I heard about that. You know, they almost did the same to us. It's not the same. It seems pretty much the same to me. So your people were infected with a genetic mutation? An infection that makes only a few in a thousand children survive birth? And I suppose it's destroying your entire species? I suppose it isn't all the same. I don't expect you to understand. But don't compare humanity's fate with the Krogan. Sorry, Rex. I wasn't trying to get you upset. Your ignorance doesn't upset me, Shepard. As for the Krogan, I gave up on them long ago. The genophage infected us, but it's not what's killing us. Are your people really dying? We're sure not getting any stronger. We're too spread out. None of us are interested in staying in our own system. Lots of species have left their homes and prospered. But they go to colonize new worlds. We're not settlers. We're warriors. We want to fight. So we leave. Hire ourselves out. 
And most of us never go back. What can you tell me about the Genophage? Ask the Salarians if you want details. They made it. All I know, it makes breeding nearly impossible. Thousands die in stillbirth, and most never get that far. Every Krogan is infected, every one. And no one's rushing to find a cure. Why don't the Krogan try to find a cure? When was the last time you saw a Krogan scientist? You ask a Krogan, would he rather find a cure for the Genophage or fight for credits? He'll choose fighting every time. It's just who we are, Shepard. I can't change that. Nobody can. So long, Rex. Shepard. Commander? Do you have a few minutes to talk? One on one? I'm sorry, Commander. I need to get my duty squared away. I wouldn't mind talking more later, though. What's your opinion of the last mission? Kinda wish you'd got there sooner, Commander. No offense, I appreciate the rescue. I just wish... You wish we'd been able to save the rest of your unit? Yes, ma'am. If I had been more alert, we wouldn't have been cut down by an ambush. The Geth are perfect ambushers. They don't move, they don't make noise, they don't even breathe. They have flashlight heads, ma'am. I'll make sure it doesn't happen again. Dismissed, Chief. Ma'am? Thanks for bringing me on board, Commander. I knew working with the Spectre would be better than life at CSEC. Have you worked with the Spectre before? Well, no, but I know what they're like. Spectres make their own rules. You're free to handle things your way. At CSEC, you're buried by rules. The damn bureaucrats are always on your back. For the most part, the rules are there for a reason. Maybe. But sometimes it feels like the rules are only there to stop me from doing my work. If I'm trying to take down a suspect, it shouldn't matter how I do it, as long as I do it. But CSEC wants it done their way. Protocol and procedure come first. That's why I left. So you just quit because you didn't like the way they do things? There's more to it than that. It didn't start out bad, but as I rose in ranks, I got saddled with more and more red tape. CSEC's handling of Saren was typical. I just couldn't take it anymore. I hate leaving. I hope you made the right choice. I'd hate for you to regret it later. Well, that's sort of why I teamed up with you. It's a chance for me to get off the Citadel, see how things are done outside CSEC. Either way, I plan to make the most of this. And without CSEC headquarters looking over my shoulder, well, maybe I can get the job done my way for a change. If getting the job done means endangering innocent people, then no. We get the job done right, not fast. Got it? I wasn't trying to. I understand, Commander. The Norman, the Mako infantry fighting vehicle, was designed for the System Alliance's frigates. Though the interior is cramped, an M35 is small enough to be carried in the cargo bay and easily deployed on virtually any world. With its turreted 155 mm mass accelerator and coaxially mounted machine gun, the Mako can provide a fire team with weapon support as well as mobility. Since Alliance Marines may be required to fight on any world, the Mako is environmentally sealed and equipped with microthrusters for use on low gravity planetoids. The Mako is powered by a sealed hydrogen oxygen fuel cell and includes a small element zero core. While not large enough to nullify the vehicle's mass, the core can reduce it enough to be safely airdropped. When used in conjunction with thrusters, it also allows the Mako to extricate itself from difficult terrain. Hey, Commander. Looking for some extra supplies before you head out? What have you got? Whatever you want. Armor, weapons, mods. It's not standard Alliance issue, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. 
Well, as long as you don't mind paying for it. Why should I pay you for my weapons and armor? My stuff doesn't come from the Alliance. I have to purchase it myself, and it's not cheap. Hell, the licenses alone have set me back more than I'd like. But no licenses, no goods. Without the goods, I'm out of a job. Let's see what you've got. You bet, Commander. Biotic. Omni tools are handheld devices that combine a computer microframe, sensor analysis pack, and manufacturing fabricator. Versatile and reliable, an Omni tool can be used to analyze and adjust the functionality of most standard equipment, including weapons and armor, from a distance. The fabrication module can rapidly assemble small three dimensional objects from common reusable industrial plastics, ceramics, and light alloys. This allows for field repairs and modifications to most standard items, as well as the reuse of salvaged equipment. Omni tools are standard issue for soldiers and first in colonists. Measures in nearly a century. That's your government. 
The Conclave is our civilian branch of government. Each ship can elect a representative to serve on the Conclave and make decisions that affect the fleet as a whole. On matters that affect an individual ship, however, the captain has the final say. It's a tradition that dates back to the early days, when the fleet was governed by martial law. Fortunately, most captains nowadays are smart enough to have an elected council from their crew to give them advice and guidance. So the ultimate power rests with elected officials? In practice, the Conclave and the respective council for each ship tend to set the rules that govern our daily lives. But in theory, we are still under military jurisdiction. The five top-ranking military officials in the fleet serve on the Admiralty Board. These five have the power to overrule any decision by the Conclave in case of emergency. To do so requires unanimous agreement among the Admiralty. And they can only do this once. After that, the entire board must resign their posts. It's a safeguard that served us well. In nearly three centuries, the Admiralty Board has only overruled the Conclave four times. I want to know more about the Geth. I doubt I can tell you anything you don't already know. It's been almost three centuries since they drove my people into exile. All I know is the story of their origins. What they were when we created them, and how they turned on us. Interesting. The Geth were originally created to serve as an automated manual labor force. Initially, their intelligence was as limited as any VI. Over time, we made small modifications to their programming to allow them to perform more varied and complex tasks, bringing them closer and closer to true AI status. How come the Council didn't step in and stop you? This wasn't true AI research. We may have been skirting the bounds of the law, but we never did anything that was actually illegal. The changes were so insignificant, so gradual, that we were able to control them. Or so we thought. But one thing we underestimated was the power of the neural network. A million Geth thinking simultaneously created an inherently unstable matrix. So the Geth share brain power? Many of the Geth's logic systems were designed to work in concert with other nearby Geth. Basically, the more of them you have in the group, the smarter they are. So there's some sort of group consciousness? No, nothing like that. They cannot share sensory data or information. Their programming cannot handle that much simultaneous input. Each Geth maintains an individual awareness and identity. The neural network only operates on a process-based level. It's basically the synthetic equivalent of a subconscious. But when they're in close proximity, they can coordinate low-level functional processes, freeing up more capacity for original or independent thought. That doesn't make any sense. I'm probably oversimplifying. The Geth are incredibly advanced and complex creations. All you need to know is that they get smarter when they gather in large numbers. As we built more and more Geth, their effective intelligence became more sophisticated, more abstract. One day, a Geth began to ask its Quarian overseer questions about the nature of its existence. Am I alive? Why am I here? What is my purpose? As you can imagine, this caused a near panic among my people. I don't see what's so bad about those questions. The Geth were created to engage in mundane, repetitive, or dangerous manual labor. That's fine for machines, but it won't satisfy a sentient being for long. The Geth were showing signs of rudimentary self-awareness and independent thought. If the Geth were intelligent, then we were essentially using them as slaves. It was inevitable the newly sentient Geth would rebel against their situation. We knew they would rise up against us, so we acted first. A general order went out across all Quarian-controlled systems to permanently deactivate all Geth. The Geth responded to this order violently. Hey, you can't blame them for fighting for their survival. We had no other choice. The Geth were already on the verge of revolution. 
By acting quickly, we had a chance to end the war before it began. The hope was that most of the Geth would still be little more than machines, incapable of organized resistance. But they had progressed much further than anyone anticipated. The war was long and bloody. Millions upon millions of Quarians died at their hands. In the end, we were forced to flee our own homeworld. We feared the Geth would pursue us, but they never came beyond the Veil. Now, we drift through space, exiled, searching for a way to reclaim what was once ours. I want to know more about the pilgrimage. When my people reach maturity, we leave our birth ships and seek acceptance with a new crew. It's necessary to maintain genetic diversity among the fleet. But no ship wants to accept someone who will be a burden on them. So, to prove our worth, we embark on a pilgrimage. We set out alone, leaving the flotilla and our families behind us. We only return once we have found something of value we can bring back to the fleet. This is presented as a gift to the captain of the respective ship we wish to join. If the gift is accepted, we are welcomed into the crew. Can a captain choose to reject the gift? And that doesn't happen often. Most captains are eager to increase the size of their crew. It increases their own standing in our society. Even when a gift is not particularly valuable, the captain usually accepts it out of a sense of tradition. However, there is a stigma to presenting a substandard gift. It's not the best way to make a good impression on a new community. Most pilgrims don't return until they find something worthwhile. I want to talk about something else. Like what? I should go. See you later. Biotic, an artificial intelligence, is a self-aware computing system capable of learning and independent decision-making. Creation of a conscious AI requires adaptive code, a slow, expensive education, and a specialized quantum computer called a blue box. An AI cannot be transmitted across a communication channel or computer network. Without its blue box, an AI is no more than data files. Loading these files into a new blue box will create a new personality, as variations in the quantum hardware and runtime results create unpredictable variations. The Geth serve as a cautionary tale against the dangers of rogue AI, and in Citadel space, they are technically illegal. Advocacy groups argue, however, that an AI is a living, conscious entity, deserving the same rights as organics. They argue that continued use of the term artificial is institutionalized racism on the part of organic life. The term synthetic is considered the politically correct alternative. When subjected to an electrical current, the rare material dubbed element zero, or ESO, emits a dark energy field that raises or lowers the mass of all objects within it. This mass effect is used in countless ways, from generating artificial gravity to manufacturing high-strength construction materials. It is most prominently used to enable faster-than-light space travel. ESO is generated when solid matter, such as a planet, is affected by the energy of a star going supernova. The material is common in the asteroid debris that orbits neutron stars and pulsars. These are dangerous places to mine, requiring extensive use of robotics, telepresence, and shielding to survive the incredible radiation from the dead star. Only a few major corporations can afford the setup costs required to work these primary sources. Humanity discovered refined element zero at the Prothean Research Station on Mars. 
allowing them to create Mass Effect fields and develop FTL travel. Element Zero can increase or decrease the mass of a volume of space-time when subjected to an electrical current. With a positive current, mass is increased. With a negative current, mass is decreased. The stronger the current, the greater the magnitude of the dark energy mass effect. In space, low mass fields allow FTL travel and inexpensive surface to orbit transit. High mass fields create artificial gravity and push space debris away from vessels. In manufacturing, low mass fields permit the creation of evenly blended alloys, while high mass compaction creates dense, sturdy construction materials. The military makes extensive use of mobility-enhancing technologies, with Mass Effect utilizing fighting vehicles standard frontline issue in most military forces. Mass Effect fields are also essential in the creation of kinetic barriers or shields to protect against enemy fire. Hey Commander, you know that Quarian Tally? She's been spending all her time down here asking me about our engines. I'll tell her to leave you alone. What? No, she's amazing. I wish my guys were half as smart as she is. Give her a month on board and she'll know more about our engines than I do. She's got a real knack for technology, that one. I can see why you wanted her to come along. I figured she'd be a real asset to the team. You've got an eye for talent, Commander. But I'm guessing that's not why you came down here. Fill me in on the IES stealth system. How does it work exactly? You can't hide a ship out in space. They emit too much heat and radiation. Too easy for sensors to pick them up. Unless you find a way to capture those emissions. So our stealth systems trap the energy we give off in storage sinks built into the ship itself. No emissions to give away our location. Eventually the sinks have to be vented. More than a few hours silent running and they overheat. Cook us inside our own hull. There's no way for anyone to detect us? A visual scan can still pick us up. Anyone looking out a window can see us plain as day. But you have to be pretty close to get an actual visual out in space. Most vessels rely on scanners. As long as the stealth systems are engaged, they can't see us. Not unless we accelerate to FTL speeds. Why doesn't it work with faster than light travel? Cranking up the FTL, blue shifts our emissions, pushes them into frequencies too high to capture in the sinks. As soon as we make the jump, it's like setting off a flare. Sensors can pick up our location whenever we enter or exit FTL flight, but for short-range missions, our stealth systems are amazing, and we've got the only one. Where else have you served, Adams? If you name a class of Alliance ship, I've probably served on it. Everything from dreadnoughts and carriers right down to frigates like the Normandy. My last assignment was on the Tokyo, only a cruiser, but she was a good ship. Couldn't hold a candle to the Normandy, though. I want to know more about the Normandy. She's the best ship I've ever served on, probably the fastest vessel ever designed. She's the only one using the new Tantalus Drive Core. What's so special about the Tantalus Drive Core? Proportionally, it's about twice the size of any other vessel. Not only are we faster, we can run at FTL speeds longer before we have to discharge the core. Carry on, Adams. Aye, aye, Commander. Faster than light drives use element zero cores to reduce the mass of the ship, allowing higher rates of acceleration. This effectively raises the speed of light within the mass effect field, allowing high speed travel with negligible relativistic time dilation effects. Starships still require conventional thrusters, chemical rockets, commercial fusion torch, economy ion engine, or military anti-proton drive, in addition to the FTL drive core. With only a core, a ship has no motive power. The amount of ESO and power required for a drive increases exponentially to the mass being moved and the degree it is being lightened. Very massive ships, or very high speeds, are prohibitively expensive. If the field collapses while the ship is moving at faster than light speed, the effects are catastrophic. The ship is snapped back to sublight velocity. The enormous excess energy shed in the form of lethal Cherenkov radiation. Larger warships are generally classified in one of four weights. Frigates are small, fast ships used for scouting and screening of larger vessels. 
Frigates often operate in wolf pack flotillas. Cruisers are middleweight combatants, faster than dreadnoughts and more heavily armed than frigates. Cruisers are the standard patrol unit and often lead frigate flotillas. Dreadnoughts are kilometer-long capital ships mounting heavy long-range firepower. They are only deployed for the most vital missions. Carriers are dreadnought-sized vessels that also carry large numbers of fighters. Smaller vessels are almost exclusively used in a support role to the warships during combat. Fighters are one-man craft used to perform close-range attacks on enemy ships. Interceptors are one-man craft optimized for destroying opposing fighters. Commander, I'm picking up some strange readings. Really strange, like off the damn charts. It looks like it's coming from an underground complex a few clicks away from the drop zone.
Shepard. At least it's a dry heat. 